Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome into the Take Up. Today we have episode 152, Thinking Small, Thin Threads and Tiny Text. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome in to the Take Up. Happy to have you guys in on this Education Friday. Happy to be here to serve you guys with the best information I can and also talk to you about the debates we have about the work that we do. And this is a perennial topic. This is a topic that comes up often. I have taught so many classes about different forms of lettering and about dealing with specialty threads that this may be retread for some of you. And honestly, part of what I'm hoping to do today is talk about the debates that happen and the different ways that people address these problems. Because honestly, there are more ways than one to get tiny text made. And there are more ways than one that work because really every time we talk about digitizing or embroidery and we have this tendency to reduce it down to what works versus what doesn't work, we forget that it's what works on a particular garment with particular threads with a particular design and in this case with a particular font. So we're going to cover a lot of ground here. And honestly, I don't know how deep we'll get into any one thing. We'll see what questions you have. We'll see what comments you have. And I will see where the spirit takes me today. Because what I've decided after teaching this thing so many times is I'm just going to let this fly. We're going to talk about this kind of off the cuff and discuss what small lettering is, what it isn't, what tiny thread can do for you, what it can't. And maybe I will try and get to some of the essentials, but in the way of trying to help you predict whether or not a use case for small text, a reason why you want to use small text is worthwhile and what you can do to make it work. Also, why it is that different methods work out. As you guys know with me, I like to break it down to some elemental nature of what's going on on the embroidery machine, what's going on with our materials in order to get to maybe a slightly greater truth than use these settings, get this result. I love that. That's great that we can sometimes do project level education where if I teach you the recipe, you get through it and you end up doing the thing you want to do, progressing the way you'd like to. At the same time, I feel like understanding why things work and how things work and thinking about what's happening when it comes to that interaction between needle, thread, uh, material, support systems, support materials as well, uh, what's happening with the machine and settings, and then what's happening with the file and digitizing. That big interaction has a lot of moving parts. And if we discuss that and get to an understanding of that, then we have more control and we have more understanding of what's going on and we have a chance to predict our outcomes or at least to have a little bit better control over our outcomes. So like I said, I'm really hoping that we can uh, get to a point where we have a little more <laughs> truth behind that. Sorry for some technical issues we had earlier on here getting set up, but we're gonna start into it. We're gonna talk about tiny text. We're gonna talk a little bit about fine threads as well. And as you can see, we'll bring up the <laughs> thumbnail one more time. Um, there's lots of different ways we can handle this. There's lots of things to talk about. There's different methods. There's different tiny threads. There's font considerations. There's how we digitize. There's underlay. There's a lot going on with small text. The funny thing is, I think that small text actually exists almost as a place where we're on the border of what embroidery can do, where we all run into it, where we all push into this envelope of what embroidery can do, what machines can do, what you can achieve by jamming a needle thousands of times through a garment with thread attached, and how can we make that look clean? And the thing is, there's this big spectrum of both what's possible, uh, what's acceptable to us, and what we can do to mitigate those differences. Everybody wants to talk about tiny text. I think also we'll definitely go out onto the, uh, the plank a little bit where I say, hey, why not? don't do the super tiny text if it's not important. There's also that, there's the, the uh, customer communication part of that, but I think we've got a lot to cover. Like I said, there's a lot going on. I think it's fair, there's a lot going on. And if you have questions, you have comments that you wanna discuss this stuff, by all means, let me know and we will get into it. But for right now, I'm gonna say hi to some of the folks who are live. If you know, if you are on the hashtag replay squad, I love you and I'm glad you're here. Please leave your comments as well. But I say hi to the folks who come in and say hi to me on these Friday shows. So Cindy King says, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Cindy. We got Frank who is in as well saying good evening all. Frank from over the UK, awesome promoter and educator himself. Heather Davidson is in, good evening, Heather. Uh, we've got Sunrise Tactical saying good afternoon. We've got Maureen saying good evening from Pennsylvania. Uh, we've got all kinds of folks coming in. Barb's coming in from North Central Minnesota, with uh, Minnesota Custom Made. Uh, we definitely have folks in from all over the world. 
And we have uh, another wonderful educator of my own caliber in my own place, uh, Lisa Shaw, who I work with, saying, hello, Eric, good to see you this afternoon. And hello, Lisa, I'm sure you have fielded many questions yourself about this. But I'll go ahead and answer this question first. Uh, Frank says, what's class is tiny text, uh, i.e. sub five? I don't think so. I think that small text can be difficult uh, sub eight. I mean, really, five millimeters is nice, safe text. The thing is, we get we get sub five millimeters, we're going to have problems. I will talk about sub five millimeter text. In, and honestly, I'm going to talk about text, including different thread weights. You know, we, we usually work with 40 weight thread. That's the thread that we're all uh, familiar with as embroidery thread is the most available, but we are increasingly exposed to uh, 60 weight thread is more common by far now than it was when I first started embroidery and people are then getting down into four millimeter text safely readily. But now we're getting into three millimeter and sub three sometimes, depending on the text that we're working with, depending on the kind of thread that we can work with and depending on the material that we're on. And I mean, I can show you crazy stuff, like including samples that aren't mine. I have some samples from the shows. This is one of the ones that I think, uh, sometimes I hate to say this, this is a beautiful sample. I believe this is from Raphael Gloa, who I think is out in Scotland. Um, and he does this awesome stuff. He's got a piece that he did for Tajima that I'm going to bring up on screen right now. I'm just going to break the, let's break the sequence and talk about it immediately, right? So I'm going to go ahead and share, uh, share my second screen and show you a sample that came from the came from the trade show. So here's one that you see out on the trade show floors. This was in the Tajima booth, the Hirsch booth at the last DAX show. And when we're looking at this, I want you to understand that we're talking about, you know, these are sub two millimeter lowercase letters. But even in looking at this at a glance, at a quick uh, picture that I took randomly while we were going past this booth, uh, walking through the DAX show, there's a few things that are really uh, quickly obvious to anybody who knows what they're going through. And we're going through, um, the, the process of dealing with small text and, and learning what it can do. Number one, when we look at it from a distance, we're like, wow, that's awesome. It's legible. That's crazy. Looks great. First thing I'm going to point out, if we zoom in real tight, um, there's definitely flaws in this. This is a piece that is out there as a sample for everyone to look at and idolize. And um, there's some stuff that's rough. Number one, if you're dealing with super tiny straight stitch text like this, Straight stitch text, if you start trimming or locking off in between them, and you can see I'm kind of highlighting this stuff, I'll go ahead and grab pointer focus. So when I, if I point at the stuff, you can see it. Uh, you'll see my cursor on screen, we'll grab that. But if we're looking in between the, the words, obviously they're connected. I think if you look out from a distance, that's not that obvious. It's not that much of a problem. Some customers would like it. If each one of these had to have uh, ties in certain regions, I think a lot of these small stitches wouldn't unravel anyway. But what we can see is there have been some places where we're having issues with tails or we're having issues with ties that are on the sample. And we've got some issues where when we started new letters and we have trimmed that we've got uh, loops or knots. Also, if we look at this, uh, we have some of the stitches that didn't quite make it. They didn't exactly meet where some of the T's don't look the same. Um, now, don't get me wrong. This is excellent small text. It's tiny text that's beautiful. And this small, tiny, beautiful text, uh, great looking text. However, first thing is, if you're trying to make it perfect, and I mean perfect, where there are no flaws, this isn't it. It is not without flaws. It has flaws. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's one of those things on the realm of acceptability. If you want a lot of tiny text, well, you can do that with straight stitch text, but it does mean you'll very likely either be digitizing it manually or using text that was very specifically digitized for this usage um, that then we can't scale up without replacing it. Certainly it has to maintain its scale. Scale is really important when we're on this size. And I can see this was done manually because if we look, um, the various letters do not match. The E's are not the same. This was done, Raphael probably did this all manually. Like I said, super impressive, but we can see things that, uh, as we are dealing with people learning digitizing, they sometimes don't accept it. They look at these pieces where we have like multiple passes over something and it doesn't look exactly the same from letter to letter. But I always tell people, okay, back up, let's judge it like somebody looking at it from a distance. And it, it is, it's very impressive stuff. What I'm gonna tell you is, there is a really good reason why this is on incredibly smooth material and why it's black on white. This same text, white on black, uh, on material with texture, is very likely to have to look a little more broken or sunken. And so straight stitch text is wonderful. But the thing to remember is when we get to a certain point of micro text, we have to say, all right, what's acceptable to me? What do I want out of it? What does it have to look like? Does it have to match a font? In this case, we've used both thin threads and straight stitch text to make an incredible, uh, 
an incredible version of this script text. Like I said, Raphael did a great job of this piece. But in doing this piece, you have to realize that this is not what everything can be. And if we were working with a company who happened to have a white text on black and they want something like this, it's not likely to look that great. It's likely to look stitchy. I know I always make the joke about stitchiness, but a customer will say it's stitchy and, and we will all get frustrated because it's how it is. But absolutely, that's just what I'm saying. Uh, but let's go ahead and grab a couple of comments because I fully agree with this. Mike says, uh, sub five millimeter is certainly tiny, but any less any satins less than 1.5 millimeter are a pain in the butt, no matter what the height is. Absolutely. Remember how I said that I always like to talk about these essential nature of embroidery questions? Anytime we are dealing with a satin stitch of that width, the chances are, especially in 40 weight, we're already getting close to where it's not going to work. Like lower than like 0.8 mils, we're starting to get where um, if you're running a 7511 needle is one of, one of the things that matters. The width of your needle is one of those measurements, right? So a 7511 needle, um, we really can't be doing stitches under 0.75 millimeters because that's the width of the needle blade. Like we're going to drop that thing right in there. So if we have a stitch and we're dropping it 0.75 mils away from the original stitch we were in, the likelihood is we're dropping it in the same hole. Like we're not moving. Let alone, if we look at this micro scale at our fabrics, many of these fabrics have grain, they have texture, they have ribs, they have textures that don't look obvious to us at the macro scale when we're looking at the garment. But when we're looking at it at the micro scale and running on super narrow satin stitches, the chances are we're gonna run afoul of that texture. And we're gonna have to do things like mitigate it with water soluble toppings, uh, use extra pull compensation to try and make them line up correctly. And, and uh, you know, God forbid you have to do something like outline it or use multiple colors or shadow it or something else. Um, that can be very difficult. So yeah, sub five is certainly tiny, but really it's about the fineness of the satin stitches, the closeness, and the, the closeness together of elements and the openings in, in letters or loops could be loops in any detailed work. It doesn't have to be text. Um, the reason I think text is, <laughs> the reason why text is so commonly the question is because when text is wrong, because it happens to be that most lettering, um, we understand it from the perspective of people who have been around print, right? We come from a world where printing is exactly how it is expected to be. It is not even metal type printing where things could get sloppy as the type got older and or an old type that was cast a long time ago has been used over and over again. We come from a world where print is incredibly clean, where especially now we have resolutions on our displays where our digital type is very, very clean and not pixelated. Everything is very clean and linear and text, if anything, will show you when things are out of line wonky. If these verticals on text are leaning left or right, they can look goofy really quickly. Anything that's wrong with a letter is very obvious. And we're all so familiar with the shapes that if something closes up or is missing or has an element that's skewed, we're very quick to point it out. Customers are very quick to point it out. So like, well, like Mike says, tiny text is necessary evil. If you're a patch person, I know Mike, you are, and I have been over the course of my time. If you're somebody who works in patches and emblems and also business to business, uh, anytime we're doing like uh, civic heraldry is what I will say. It's more common in, in, in the EU and other places in the uh, UK where you literally have like a coat of arms type design for a city or a place. But we have city seals and all sorts of community seals in the US that are very similar. And if you work military, I've done a lot of military and um, military adjacent uh, kind of research bases, stuff like that, research uh, facilities. They tend to have lots of detail, lots of text in small areas, and it's all important to them. So yeah, totally, totally a, a necessary evil, but it's always happening. But yeah, it's one of those things. And okay, some people, like we said, Cindy says, I don't care for that look. She's looking at that straight stitch text. I know, not everybody does. And that's the thing, not all customers are gonna do it either. Though I will agree with Frank and say, Rafal does beautiful work. Absolutely he does. So I don't want you to think that me pointing out the things that some customers don't like about small text is me saying that that's, you know, that's what I think you should do uh, or that you shouldn't do because it's got some issues that people don't love it. But yeah, absolutely. And this is the question I always get from people. I talk about the handshake distance. And in fact, I think I may bring up my whole, you know, handshake distance. In fact, I'll bring up the original, I believe it's the original uh, slide from the first time I ever taught the handshake distance. If I can bring it up, um, I'm going to bring that slide up and show you. This was my very first time I think I taught the handshake distance online uh, was this slide. 
And I said, okay, there's the viewer's perspective of something. And I did this for a long time ago for a webinar series. I'm like, hey, uh, the handshake distance. Here's what I talk about when I say zoom out a little bit and think about this differently. Um, the handshake distance is how far away you're going to reasonably be from lettering when you see it. And especially, now this is a, a US thing that I'm going to go ahead and give you the actual numbers for. It can be different. Different countries are closer talkers or for, far, further talkers. People uh, maintain different personal bubbles of space. But in the US, there was a study, and I believe it was done in like the uh, late 60s was the original study that I read, uh, where the average distance people stand apart from each other for an American handshake is is between two and four feet. So for my money, what I always tell people is, if you cannot see the text or read it from three feet away, you're not going to read it at all. Now, that is a, that's a fairly good argument. And that's also why Sid, uh, Cindy says this, which I love. Uh, I don't think I'd want somebody to get that close to my chest to read the text. And as an embroiderer who stared at somebody's garment and, and had them look at them askew when I realized, oh, I'm looking at your decoration, not you, I can say that for sure, people don't want you to get close enough to read everything. However, however, even though that is my argument, right? This is my argument that I've been teaching for years. This argument that the viewing distance is between two and four feet. And if you can't see it from three feet away, it's not going to be seen. Uh, and moreover, that something that looks good up close might be illegible at three to four feet away, right? Um this is what I always say. If it is absolutely paramount that somebody gets this information, then I try to make sure that they make it large enough to read easily. That's the point for me, right? That's what I'm talking about. If somebody wants to see something and read it from a distance, it should be legible at that size, at three to four feet away. However, here's the thing that over the years I have had to kind of concede to. People have things in their logos that though they are not critical to necessarily read from three feet away, they are important to the logo, they're important to the spirit of the thing, or they're important to the civic seal or whatever it is um, that this particular piece is referring to, right? So it, there are things that are in logos that are important to them either way. And like I said, I'm going to go ahead and bring up an example of, of something like that. And here's one that I, I've done that I show in my classes because it is an example of, of this kind of work. Um, this is a piece done for a place called the Kinesio Taping Association. Have you ever seen that Kinesio tape, the tape where you uh, athletes help their muscles out with supportive tapes? Um, Kinesio is the company that really started that. That was actually in Albuquerque, a uh, uh, guy named Ken who we met when he was working on this stuff. This is a very small left chest. And though we don't need people to understand that the place was started in 1984, though we don't need people to read the word taping in the middle of this, because number one, though it says Kinesio Taping Association, you can read that. It is legible in this straight stitch text. Once again, black on white, because I know what I'm doing. <laughs> even though I've managed to even get some serifs and some texture to this. So it doesn't just look like a block font, which is one of the things we learned to do is if you can make something in a, a block font, undecorated sans serif font in caps, you can make it very small because it's the most open your lettering is likely going to be. Even though we had all that stuff, what's important about that isn't that they're going to read Kinesio Taping Association. In fact, I don't have this pulled up right now, but let me go ahead and see if I can pull up. Um, I'll go ahead and pull up the actual file for you to look at. Underneath it is explanatory text. Like in the actual piece, when we're looking at it, it actually had, oh, and I don't actually have that version, but it had, the original had explanatory text underneath it. Um, I do have the version that I, that I was going to show you, but uh, originally it said underneath it, this is the version I'm going to show you, it didn't have it, but right right here before, it said Kinesio Taping Association, again, in satin stitch text. This was actually a piece that was done for a, a different placement where we didn't have that in. We do it. We did have, though, this KTA addition to it, because that was one of the other um, Kinesio Taping Association logo types that was used. But the thing is, it was important to them as a, a function of this looks like our logo. It's important to us. If you see our logo, you can see that there's text in the middle that says taping on this banner that goes around this Vitruvian man. All of our logo types, all of our seals have this on there. We have the laurel wreath. We have the Vitruvian man. We have the taping down the banner. We have the since 1984. It all has to fit in the space. Now, it's been altered a little bit to make it work for this, this uh, size. But what we can see is when we get in here really deeply, yeah, we've gotten some pretty small text. If I measure this text here, we're talking about two millimeters. This is 2.2 millimeter text that runs more like about two millimeters in that sense. So we're talking about, 
you know, sub three millimeter text in that taping. If I go zoom into that taping, it is incredibly small. But the truth of the matter is, I it's not always necessary, but we have to admit when we have things like city seals that are important culturally, uh, when we have things that are important to the company, like, like I said, this is once again, two millimeter text uh, up here in this taping. Are they going to read it from a distance? No. Do we want to have that entirely blank? Not really, because it doesn't look like the logo anymore. And it's important to the people who are wearing it and to the look of their, of their branding, even if it's not important to us as viewers reading it from three feet away. So I have to go ahead and call myself out. Like I said, I like to tell on myself. If I've got something where I can uh, tell on myself and be confessional, I generally will. Uh, in this case, though this is very nice looking and we like the piece that was there, and though it is fair for me to give you guys the whole handshake distance take, because it really is the case if something is important, and this is the, the classic case, if you wanted somebody for some reason to take down your website, if you wanted them to know your phone number from your chest, why I don't know. Cause every time I ask this in classes, I say, raise your hand if anybody has ever, or if you've ever stopped somebody or written down a website or somebody's phone number off of their chest or hat and almost never do I get a single hand. Once in a while I do, and I think sometimes these folks are just being jerks. Like they're just trying to be contrary sometimes. Uh, mostly what it is is, no, I remembered somebody's website off their hat. And I'm like, awesome. You probably didn't take down the whole thing. And back in the day, now this has been a long time since people did this. They wanted to even include the triple dub, right? They wanted that triple W on that thing, which is impossible. And when we had that, they were even reducing that size more. Now, once again, I made a fake version for Black Duck, the shop that I worked at when I did this original slide deck. And I often show this. So I think it's still a powerful image. Even though it looks great right in front of you, if you stood back away from it, and this is simulated by making it smaller, look how much more cluttered everything is with all of this text here. And the other thing to ask yourself is, what it's, is it really necessary? Is it something we need to do? So that's the first question I always ask about small text. Is it necessary? Is it something we need to do? And that's, that's always how it is. But that's the thing. And here, I love what Lisa said. I'm just gonna bring Lisa's comment in because she's hit the nail on the head. I don't have to say anything else. Um, if you had left that taping blank, it would be something that would be obvious as missing. The owner of the logo will see the words and that's important. 100%. Lest we forget, lest we forget that people make emotional decisions about buying and have emotional reactions to the things that they do buy, when they buy equipment or apparel from us or hard goods, whatever it is, but let's, we're talking about apparel, we're talking about embroidery today. They buy embroidery from us and they put it on. If it doesn't feel like it's theirs and they don't recognize the thing that's important to them in it, it will not have the value to them that it could. That's when it's important. Or like I said, civic seals, police badges, just leaving the text out is usually not an option. People know it says police. People know it says the name of the city or the county. However, if you don't put it in there, people are going to miss it. So I think that's useful. But we're going to talk, talk about some more technical stuff. But I'm going to go ahead and grab a couple more comments and we'll get into more technical stuff and we'll discuss some things and show some examples as well. So I don't want you guys to think that I'm just going to come out here and say, small text, don't do it. No, nah, we're not going to do that. We're going to get into more before we get done. I Hopefully it'll be a shorter episode than most, but God's no, I probably won't make it. But let's go ahead and, and finish this out. Uh, Cindy says, we do hug in Texas, but still, yeah, you don't want somebody's face in your chest. I agree. Uh, you're making everybody laugh. Frank's dying. Uh, Barb's dying. Sunrise is dying. I'm there with you. But it's true. Uh, and Cindy's, Cindy's right on this one. Uh, we as decorators are constantly touching people's clothes. The other thing that's embarrassing is you take me to a store that sells apparel. I will flip out, inside out any garment that I see and zoom in on stuff. But absolutely. Yeah, Frank, don't look that hard. Yep, got it. <laughs> but this is what Frank says. You know, I must admit, I prefer 8 to 10 millimeter text. You can be right without looking too hard. 100%. I recommend most people do things like personalization. So if you've got to have a name or a department or anything like that on your chest, uh, 10 to 12 is where I usually land. So if we're talking about, if we're in the land of imperial units, we're talking about like half an inch to a little bit less. Uh, half an inch would be 12.5 millimeters. That is a very nice size if you can manage it. Often we have to go smaller to just fit things in the appropriate area we have to lay them out the way they need to be. But yeah, eight to 10 mils is really a fantastic place to be when you can. The problem is sometimes you can't, right? So when we're talking about tiny text, you know, sometimes we do have to get smaller than that. Um, 
we talk about safe sizes a lot here. What what con really constitutes a safe size for text? I am going to go ahead and bring up the old file one more time and let you guys see safe text sizes so you understand what I'm talking about. This is the one that I always show, but I'll show it one more time for anybody who was in the back who didn't listen to the last time I talked about it. The reason why we usually say five millimeters and why, why the original question likely was, is tiny text below five millimeters? Um, that was essentially this way, right? This is the concept that we think about it. Just like Mike said earlier, any satin stitch under 1.5 millimeters starts to be a little wonky. We can start getting wiggle. We can start getting textural interference and issues. Also, if we're not careful with our underlay, we can get underlay popping out. If you guys don't remember, I talked about underlay a few episodes back and how sometimes edge run underlay pops out if we don't have enough inset or if we don't have enough compensation, one of the two, depending on how it's set up. These things all happen when we get into this border of getting closer and closer to one millimeter, especially on 40 weight thread. On 68, which we'll talk about in a second, 68 thread, we can go all the way down a little bit smaller. But here's the thing. Can I get down to a 0.75, oh yeah, 0.75 millimeter satin stitch with a 68 thread really reliably? Yeah, I can on smooth garments, on material that will not interfere with tech with our tensions operating in a way that is useful with material that is not super thick or difficult. And some people say, okay, but then caps. And I'm like, yeah, that's the next problem with thin needles going through a structured hat that has a lot of structure inside of it in, in, the, in the buckram, the support material, the seams can then cause deviation there too. The best answer, and I'm just going to, I'll go ahead and go full screen just to give it to you. The best answer we have for embroidery, honestly, honestly, the 100%, no BS, no blow and smoke answer is if you have a chance to make the text big enough for it to run correctly for the needle and thread that is required for your garment, that works best for your garment, that's the best answer to clean text. That's not the answer everybody wants to hear. I'm just going to give it to you straight though. If you have a chance to lay things out in such a way that the text is the right size, for the needle, for the thread that you intend to use on the garment you intend to embroider, that is, of course, going to be your best answer. Can we push the envelope? 100%. We can. We're going to talk about it. Is that the best answer for clean embroidery? No. The best answer for clean embroidery is to do the thing that makes the most sense for the medium we're working in, which is often to have text that's more than the size we might expect it to be. Does it mean that's the only way to go? Absolutely, right? That's the hard part. It's like, sometimes we do it. And honestly, Cindy says, I, I wish I played hardball like Cindy. I didn't always. Um, I'm not going to spoil my customers. Either go big or go home. No 628 going on here. Hey, um, most of my work is done 30 or 40 weight thread. But what I'm going to show you, and I'm going to bring this up so you can see it. If I can uh, get this up on screen, I may have to uh, be creative here because I've got too many uh, samples out already. Um, I've got pieces where I really did go super small and I'll have to see if I can bring this up for you guys. Um, I've got pieces where it really was like very, very small, um, incredibly tiny text done on, uh, done with 40 weight thread. And here's the one I'll show you. I'll bring this up on screen so you can see it. It looks crazy, but it's absolutely uh, difficult to deal with, right? This is the, this is the one NQT 400. Does it look perfect? Absolutely not. This is not my best piece ever. What I'm going to tell you though is what you're looking at right here is three millimeter text in 40 weight thread with a 7511 needle. Does it happen? Yes. Let me show you how distorted you have to work to make that happen, right? Let me literally show you what that looks like in the real world when we have to make it happen. So I'm going to go ahead and grab that file and show you what it really looks like to make, uh, make something for that size. Right, so what does that look like in the real world? This is what it looks like in the real world. This is how distorted you have to work. You can't hardly read it. You can't hardly see what that looks like. Look at the sizes that we're dealing with. This is how distorted it is. Now, I'll, I'll go ahead and pull this over. I've got it in black thread so you can see it a little better. Um, when we're working at this scale, these blocks right here, these little grids are one millimeter. So you're barely at a millimeter, maybe 1.1 for the width of these satins. But look how distorted that text looks. So you're looking at the file that I ran. This is the file. It's not a perfect file. It's an earlier file. I've done, I've done better since. But this is the original file. That's that requirements text. Now let's go back over here and look how it ran. This is what I'm talking about you can get a lot out of your thread. You can get a lot out of your machine 
but it requires you to push the line. And I'm going to call out my problems here. If I was going to call out Rafal's, I'm going to call out mine. Um, we look over here, the bottom of that A needs to be compensated, needs to be fixed. Now, this is not the final production sample. Um, this is this is the next two final production sample. This is one of my test stitches. I don't always have the originals. I've got a lot of my test stitches around. So I can see a lot of things that are wrong with this. But what I will argue with you is that this is very legible for three millimeter uh, satin stitch with 40 weight thread. But I need more space between my letters. I can see that this A needs to have the crossbar either raised or dealt with some other way. I probably need to extend. In fact, what I can see is I made this A up here and reevaluate a little wider, and I should have done it a little bit wider over here. I can also see that the interference between the grain of the fill stitch is causing some issues with the satins, right? So truthfully, this is not really what I'm talking about, right? This is not the way that you want to do everything, but is it possible to do it with 40 weight thread? Yes. Did I have to torture that file? Absolutely. Look at the incredible amount of variation. What we can see is pull compensation always has to be in effect. So this is not as even as it should be. It's a little goofy because I actually started with keyboard text trying to save myself time, which is a big error in this case. You should do custom text. But we can see that I've got, you know, almost 0.4 mils of, of the combined pull and push comp. So what does that mean? Very much like you might expect with 40 weight thread. I'm running about 0.18 to 0.2 millimeters or 1.8 to 2 points of compensation between the satins here and the pu the push here. So I'm stopping almost two, uh, two points before and I'm swinging out two points wide because when they go together in the middle, is it perfect? No, but you can see that that Q and the U are pretty close to even with that R and the E and the rest of the line. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Is it close? Absolutely. I'm pushing the border here. But what you can see are some things that are critical, right? What are some interesting things to notice about this? We've got some manual underlayment happening here with nice long stitches. This is why you see these big wide corners here because these stitches are as long as I could make them. Now, truthfully, are they very long? Not necessarily. If I measure this stitch here, it is just about at a millimeter, but I don't want to go any shorter than that, for, especially for an underlayment. Um, if we look at this, it's got nice loose densities. Why? Because I, I didn't have the space. I couldn't put a bunch of density in here and pack it too tight. The thing is, there are different methods to go about this. Some people throw out the underlay, some people increase their density, some people lower it, and there's different ways to go about it, and they all have a tendency to work if you know the basis behind it. In this case, what I did was uh, straight stitch manual underlay, lots of compensation. Like I said, 0.2 mils of compensation on this sucker for sure, even though it's on a fill right around 0.18 to 0.2. Uh, we've got a lot of comp. We, we've very small gaps, but that's something that you can kind of get past. The holes, as you can see, are pretty rough. They don't look great. The holes on the R's are not fantastic and should probably be cleaned up. And when we look at the actual piece, uh, the holes are a little goofy. They're not perfect. But is it a piece that is legible at space? Absolutely. It is possible. Um, because the rest of the logo had so much going on, including a, a round of text underneath it, if we go back and look at the original file, um, we'll zoom that out. It had text underneath it. It was really kind of getting to be a big low because all this detail and these underlays and outlining and all the rest of this, um, you know, we had to kind of work with what we did. But the thing is, this is me fighting with a customer who really should have probably been told by a salesperson because you got to remember, this is not my choice. I'm, I'm working as an in-house digitizer at this point. I'm dealing with what's been told they can do. But at the same time, we look at the entire size of this logo. It's pretty large. You know, this is not a small logo at this point. We're looking at this piece right here and, um, you know, it's not huge, but, you know, we are three inches on the widest uh, or on the shorter diameter of this thing. We're three inches top to bottom and we're uh, getting over to three and a half wide. It's a pretty big logo. This is a big piece. So we don't really have the room to just blow the whole thing up. Uh, in all honesty, good call for this thing would have been to make it smaller and drop the small text entirely, make this text wrap all the way around. I think it would have been fine, would have been a better logo over, overall. Or if this had been in a slightly more modern era, running 60 weight thread on this would have made it a lot easier to handle. But that also comes with running specialty, or at least running the proper size needles. So that's really what it's about. We have to run the right size needles. We have to run the right size thread. But I'm going to show you again some pieces from that and discuss the different options, right? People do different things. They remove underlay. They add underlay. They lower density. They increase density, and sometimes these all work. But I'm going to show you why it works in content, in, in like in concert with each other. So that's one of those things, right? So, like I said, we've got some other stuff going on here, and uh, we can we can talk about other stuff later. We're not going to get into the software choices necessarily today. Uh, I apologize. Ask me privately. We'll do that. But what we are going to talk about is uh, 
what needle you use for super small lettering. By the way, the software I was in was uh, in Brilliance. I was Stitch Artist. I'm going to show you some stuff made in there. Uh, it was made, some of those pieces were made originally in Wilcom. I've worked in every software on the spectrum from Pulse and Design Shop and a QDT all the way up. So it's all manner of software is my current stuff I'm working on in Stitch Artist, and I'll show you some stuff there, but it depends on what, what piece I was working on. The software doesn't matter. The knowledge of where the stitches go matters, right? That's what makes things easy. But JC says, what's the needle user super small lettering? Uh, what I am going to say is I used a 7511 for most everything because my shop was outfitted all with 7511s on everything and we didn't change out. I've seen lots of people, even on 48 thread, go to the 7010s and be happier with them. But uh, Frank is totally correct. If we're using 68 thread, we want to be at 68s or 65.9s. I usually start at 65.9 um, because the other thing being, if you end up on something like hats, the thinner needle you use, the more deflection you're going to have if it's got structure in the garment. So I tend to go toward the bigger needle. Also, I don't like when the eyes get too small and we get friction, but that's uh, that doesn't necessarily happen a lot with 68 thread. And I, I get you. Cindy's like, maybe this is a logo for mixed media, vinyl lettering, something else, heat transfer. Yes. Uh, and honestly, sometimes when we have customers where it's not going to work out, absolutely. Um, this logo that I'm showing you, that that logo was not like the best idea. I worked on it a ton to get it to work right. And I had to edit this a lot to make it work correctly. It's not always the best. Some logos, it's the best call. This logo, probably not. I'm going to show you another one for which it was a better call. And we'll talk about that too. Um, really, it depends on the logo. depends on the reasoning for the small text. Um, here's one that really was a good call. Um, and this was an understated logo done for a, a tea company, Boba Tea Company. So if you know Boba Tea, um, this is a company around here that, se that sells Boba Tea. As we can see, that really is a USB plug on the side. And we've got, you know, very small lettering. We're definitely in the sub five millimeter category. Um, this was done in 60 weight thread, but you could also do a uh, 40 weight thread with this. If you had to, it would be fine. We did 60 weight thread to make it look very fine. The other thing I'm going to point out, which I always do when I show this sample, it looks like it's on a thick sweater. It is not. This is a fairly fine knit, but when we're working this small, uh, it can look very small. It looks very tiny. The thing to understand about this again is that we had to make some consider some, you know, I would say we made some compromises and we had to take some things into consideration to make it work. My method tends to be to go ahead and use fairly decent densities. I go a little lighter when I'm using more underlay and to use some underlay. And in this case, because this did sink a little bit, it was a knit fabric that had a little bit of body to it. It was thicker than a t-shirt by far. It was thinner than your thickest sweatshirt but it was thinner or thicker than your t-shirt, thinner than a thick sweatshirt. It was just a nice medium weight knit garment. Um, I believe this one might be a cardigan. I'm not remembering for sure which one, what format this was in, but absolutely this one was done with, uh, we did some fine needles on this piece to, to really bring it out. We did the original runs with 40 weight and they were happy with them, but I did some runs with 60 weight as well. The thing is uh, I tend to do the same kind of technique myself. I will use more compensation, some topping, and I will use a manually punched, uh, a manually punched center line underlay with long stitches underneath it. That is usually what I do. So for a piece like this where I'm not super concerned, I would probably do that. You know, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to drop out underlay. Well, why not? Because I'm on a textured material. It's going to sink. Um, that underlay is just one more thing to hold this stuff up from trying to sink down. Am I using a water soluble topping? Absolutely. I'm using a water soluble topping. This is the right reason for a water soluble topping, keeping your stitches elevated above something where it's going to sink in that has texture. It's a fantastic use for it. Uh, whether it's solvy or whatever sort of film style topping you use, this is the place to use it. It's going to make sense for anything with any texture on it. Once we're this small, if your text is tiny, uh, chances are you're going to have a better day if you are running some water soluble on top of it, even if it's something as uh, low, low texture as like a sport shirt that has some woven texture in it or some uh, knit texture in it. I would say any kind of texture, I'm going to want something like that on it. But the techniques are still pretty similar. I actually, actually show you this piece as well, but this is a good chance. This is one where, no, I really, uh, blowing up the lettering, can it look okay? Sure, we did a version that they that we did, but the thing is there's just not quite enough difference between the vertical height of the B here and the vertical height of the C, where it really takes the weight of the logo down. They really wanted an understated logo because they had this whole concept of very black and white, clean lines, very professional. The whole look was this very kind of minimalistic style. 
taking away from that, making the lettering really big, making the logo really big um, in embroidery, especially when we're talking about the gear for the managers that was supposed to look a little more corporate, really wasn't a call that they wanted to make and they wanted to be more fashion forward uh, as evidenced by them wearing cardigans and not random sport shirts or random work shirts. Um, this was definitely a high, uh, high quality material. They wanted this look. For them, me blowing this up another millimeter is going to change this in a way they didn't like and they definitely didn't want the overall size to change. For this customer, it made sense. Um, I agree. Sometimes it's uh, it's very worthwhile just to stick with 40 weight thread and most of the work I've done, including a lot of the fine work you guys see as detailed, um, really was done with 40 weight thread because you just have to work into the understanding of what the thread can do. You'll also look and see that very rarely is one of my satin stitches under a millimeter wide because I don't tend to swing that direction when I'm dealing with fine detail. I tend to maintain that size even uh, like almost against my will. I try and make a really fine piece for 68 thread and I got to think about it over and over because otherwise I will start making all of my columns around that one to 1 1.2 millimeter size because I know that's the best place to end up if I'm going to be having those things run small. So yeah, like I said, I'm going to show you this piece in a second here. I think it's worthwhile to actually show you the Boba T piece so we can talk about it. A um, couple different things to, to notice about it. In fact, I'm going to show you an old software as well. Let me bring up, I'll just bring up the original so you can take a look at it. So this is the original piece. We'll bring this up in uh, Stitch Artist where we currently have it. You can have a look at it. First thing to notice, yes, there's no underlay in the Boba T piece. Why is that though? Uh, we were using a, a material that now some people uh, have had remarketed as a different kind of puff material. I understood it as Q104. It was a wash away material that lifted up this text and uh, this logo. So the last version of it, we did had a raised logo that was using a specialty material. So underlay really wasn't great for that. However, we look at this piece here, we can see that we have this really clean uh, center line underlay and we can see that this underlay is unbroken. If I put on stitch points, you're not seeing more than just one stitch point in the center of each of these lines on this M. So we don't have this piece, uh, very small stitches running around it. We don't have a lot of automatic underlay where it might be futzing around on each piece of this block. It is one big unbroken piece of underlay. And in fact, it runs from right to left. And what I'll show you is in the original software, we're going to pop that up. because I think it's worthwhile to, to kind of give you guys a look at it if I can. And we'll see, I, I don't know if I can bring this up on the fly here, um, but we'll go ahead and pull it up if I can. But I'm going to show you that it's just a manual section that was done for it, that this was not quite the same. So we'll bring it in because I have have the software that has the original um, the original objects in it. So this was the original object set. And what I was going to show you is this is the underlay. The underlay was plotted ahead of time manually. So the thing to understand about that is that this underlay was plotted manually. It's, it starts here, goes through this cycle over to the end, comes back to here. And then we did each of the letters and we connected them as we went. The other thing you're gonna notice on this piece, these are capped. So this goes all the way across here. It does have some texture by overlapping, but we have a cap for the ends of the M's because they're so small. Uh, we don't overlap them. Instead, we cap across that whole thing so that we don't have a ton of overlapped uh, satins to give us extra texture in here or extra density. And we have a nice little cap down here as well. So we look at the piece, we've got a cap. We have our text here. We have a cap that's in the center we can get it to select correctly while I'm uh, flying by wire on the second screen. Uh, and you can see what this is built out of. We have these individual pieces. Yes, they exist. They are here as blocks, but we don't use automatic underlay so that we don't have any sort of weird travel. And we're very careful about the blocks lining up the way they should. So that's the thing. We use this manual underlay. Why am I using that manual underlay? Because it remains unbroken. It's long and lofty. So we have this nice, long, lofty underlay. Uh, if we scrub through it and play it, we take a look at it, this is all nice and light in our uh, density view. We can see that we don't have a lot of massive overlaps in this piece. So in this small text, there's some areas where we have a little extra density, but mostly in this text, we don't have a ton of extra density. We have a little bit of overlap, nothing crazy because we're careful with our satins. We're careful with the way those run out. Um, we don't have any area where the full satin is, is showing up highlighted. But if we take a look at it, you see in wireline, we do have those manual underlays that are very obvious. They're nice and long and lofty and hold things up. And like I said, if we go through and replay this piece, and I think I'll go ahead and go to 3D Sim for you. When we get to it, you can kind of see how that pans out, right? So here we are in our, our initial piece here. Nice, big, long stitches. Everything's plotted very carefully, starting and stopping the right places and not a lot of excessive travel. So that's the way I tend to handle it. 
And if we look at this piece, we have some, we got some density on it. Of course, we have some extra density, and we should have extra density because uh, what are we working with here? Generally, if we're working with 60 weight thread, we're going to have extra density that, that's about 25% more than 40 weight. Though you're going to notice this density is, is closer to what you would expect for 40 weight total coverage. Um, why is that? Because honestly, when we're working really small like this, you often don't need quite as much density. You can, you can lighten that up. Um, and I tend to lighten up my densities a little bit when I'm working on really small text. Uh, to the point that if we look at this piece again also, um, these, these densities here are very light, right? If I'm looking at the density here, because I have a full underlay here, I've already got a lot of color coverage that's happening. Also, what we have to understand, remember that if I pass over this twice, right? If I pass over a straight stitch twice in 40 weight thread, I've already built up that good 0.4, like half a millimeter of coverage. Very easily, I'm building up a half a millimeter of coverage. If I have to go over more than once, which can totally happen with traveling uh, closest point lettering, then that might mean that I have enough density or enough uh, coverage in those center underlay stitches that I'm starting to get close to the full width of my satin column. So we don't need a ton of, of a satin stitch on top to cover that if we're using underlay. That's why you might loosen up that density. And in this case, what are we looking at? 0. 0.6 mils, 0. 0.52 to 0. 0.6. So really low densities. You know, 0. 0. 0.5 to 0. 0.6 density is pretty low for 40 weight thread. However, you know, if we take this down again, we, we bring up the original and show that to you, you can see that it doesn't look sparse. Why does it not look too sparse? Uh, well, because the underlay plus that satin coverage is giving us all we need. And it's not too dense. It's not too heavy. It doesn't look sparse because we're covering with underlay. So I think that's the thing I'm trying to get at is that there's more ways to go about this than one. And I'll talk to, to you about them again. But like I said, we, we did safe sizes. And I'll, I'll bring that up one more time just to kind of make it clear. So yeah, working at safe sizes works. Why do we do this? Well, because we're talking about that whole concept of your needle and your smallest satin stitch, the smallest reliable satin with that 7511 needle, or even honestly in 7010 is going to be around that one millimeter. Uh, that's going to be the best way to handle that. You don't want to go too much lower than that. Down below 0.8 is a problem, or at least it certainly is going to cause more problems than not. So if we think about our reliable text, why is it five millimeters high? It's a stack of gaps that is, and this is, I'll go through the whole thing. The gaps are also 0.8 to one mil and a five millimeter piece is a stack of five of these, of these layers, satin, gap, satin, gap, satin. That's what I always teach in my classes and I still maintain it. Can you go smaller? Yeah, I just showed you that you did. I did. However, you can see that there's certainly some problems with it. And if we look at that text again, right, that is block text. That is condensed block text. And by the way, it is condensed as a font. I didn't squish it. It's a font that has the same correct stroke width all the way around, but it is narrower so that it fits in my left to right dimensions that I have to hit. And we can also see that it didn't all land exactly how I wanted to, even though I'm on a fairly smooth material with a fill underneath it, there's enough variation in this piece to cause some issues that aren't perfect quality. So does it look all right? Yeah, and from three feet, it looks great. At the same time, we can see that there's some variation we have to accept once we're pushing the boundaries, right? So we talked about all that stuff. We talked about safe, the safe sizes. We talked about these considerations, but that's the thing. We have all this to put together, right? If we're gonna get tiny text, what do we need? We should understand our safe sizes. If we're going on 60 weight thread, we can go down about a quarter smaller than that, 25% smaller than that. Four millimeter text becomes very obviously possible and honestly much less because I just showed you about 3.5 millimeter text in 40 weight thread. If like if all the plants align and your font is the correct font and you don't have serifs and everything is capitalized, you can make that happen. Um, the wrong letter can make that impossible. Because like I showed you in my in my uh, safe sizes routine, wh why do I always put up that? Uh, I don't bring. I'll pull this down again. Uh, why am I constantly, constantly uh, bringing up the, this lowercase e at the same time as the uppercase e? Is because it's your lowercase letter. It's your smallest letter that sets the size you can do, and you've got that same stack of gaps. Now, if all the letters we were doing were O's and D's and L's, then three millimeters is immediately possible. Why? because an O will only have a stack of three vertically. It'll have a, a satin, a hole in a satin. An L only has a satin and the, whatever the height of the L is. If our letters are the right letters, we can go tremendously small. The problem is most words are gonna have an E in them or an A in them or a G in them. And we're gonna have a stack that's like this. So that's the thing. It's about the shapes. It's the same as our designs. It's not a text problem. It's a satin stitch problem. It's a, it's a problem with the way that we deal with small detail, if nothing else, 
right? It is the way that we deal with small detail. It's what's going to happen when the thread hits, when the needle goes through the material, and when the thread under tension starts to sink. That's the problem we're actually having. Text is only a very obvious way it can turn out in a way that we see the problem, right? And honestly, I've made a lot of tiny, tiny text. Uh, it really depends on, on what you have available to you. And I, one of the ones I always like to show too, and I'll bring this up so you can see it. Uh, there's a piece where it does have a custom font. I just told you, hey, you can't do really tiny text unless it's a block all caps font. Can you do other ones? Yes, you can. Sometimes it depends. You can do different styles. Here is this kind of weird kind of graffiti style piece that I did for Karen Q and I've shown it a million times, but what you can see here is um, the, the nominal height of this text is about four mils. This is all 48 thread. This is on a structured hat. Um, this one's a five panel. I did it on six panels as well. In fact, I think I have a six panel image queued up just so I can say, yes, I did it. Um, it's not necessarily everything I want to show you, but the, yes, this went on six panels as well. It's a junky image. I didn't have a better picture of this particular hat, but this is one of the hats that had a bunch of structure to it. But we're looking at, at a detailed image of this piece. This text is four mils, but if we look at most of the stuff that we're working on, and this is like four, 4.5, uh, these O's are easily like three mils tall. Why? It's an O. It's a stack of three. It's easy. This text still works. Oh, well, the style is fairly open. The holes, the counters are open inside of this text. Uh, the counter on the P is open. The apertures are pretty wide. Uh, the style of the text is kind of rough. It's warped in a banner and it forgives some sins, though we can still see that I'm getting some good alignment overall. Also, because it's almost touching and it has some spurs and connectors, it's very easy for me to jump between them uh, with connecting stitches and not have to leave that piece or tie off on some thin serif. So even though we have some serif-like structures, some spikes, and some decorations on this piece, uh, the nature of the text made it easier than it could have been. If this was super small, ornate uh, script where we had curly cues and loops, you're gonna realize that your stack, that stack of five that I showed you for an a uppercase E or a lowercase E in block, the stack of satins and gaps between them starts to get higher. If there are 10 different little elements that have to have a satin stitch and a gap between them, then the chances of us getting down to five millimeters are almost nil in 48 thread because we are definitely cannot have a satin stitch that is 0.5 mils and a gap that's 0.5 mils. That's just not happening we're not gonna get that kind of uh, spacing because you're gonna drop the needle in the same place and you know that the physical nature of the needle, the physical nature of the thread trumps all of this stuff. So digitizing techniques are great and I'm gonna show you more of it. But at the same time, we have to understand that ultimately it's the physical nature of the thread itself, the needle itself paired with the specific art we're working on. If someone just tells me, what are the settings for small text? I would be like, show me the text, show me the font. I'm gonna show you something else too. I have a multi-size font that I've, a set of multi-size fonts I've worked on as part of a product. And I'm gonna show you those too and talk a little bit about the differences that you make when you make different choices at different sizes, which means that really it's about the scale and the size. Though I'm gonna grab a couple comments real quick. Uh, Lisa Shaw says, I'm with Sydney, uh, Cindy. I forget to change back needles and threads, so stick with 75, 11, 48, unless the entire project is done in like 100 weight thread. Yeah, it really depends on what's what it's for. I frequently found that being from a commercial perspective where I was often going to run the same logo on several different garments where the chances are I'm not going to get to baby every single item through the process or I might have to add customer supplied stuff to the stuff that I knew was coming. It was better for me to be versatile and to stay where 40 weight thread was gonna work than it was to do a lot of specialty work. Did I do specialty work? Yes, I did 60 weight work fairly frequently, regularly enough. Um, I did fine work or the work that I just showed you where it was absolutely just on the edge of, of functioning at all. Absolutely did that. And that is possible. At the same time, when you're thinking about the lifetime of a design being used over and over again, the better part of valor here is uh, to bravely discuss with your customer what's really possible <laughs> and to discuss what they should and shouldn't want on that piece if it's important to them. Now, certainly, also this means on certain places where we have like a, a seal that has gotten very small and it has to have something, like let's say that taping banner that we just showed, there are times where with the seal of New Mexico that I put inside of umpteen badges for police and fire, uh, that seal has a banner in it that has a Latin phrase in it. And often I make a squiggle inside that looks roughly like the phrase because at certain sizes, there's not only no chance it can be read, but it is 
not only not only can it not be read, uh, there, you really cannot physically fit it in the place where it needs to be for the rest of the badge to work out. And in that case, it's just like reducing detail for any other design. If you had a bunch of detail, like an architectural design, you get a building with columns everywhere. If it gets to the point where it's the size of a dime, well, then we start to remove some of those lines because the thread physically can't fit there. We have 12 columns and suddenly there's eight and no one knows because we remove the excess columns and we make the other ones bigger so that they stitch out correctly. And the same thing happens with lettering. Sometimes when it gets down to a point where there's no chance for it to be legible, then we can remove things and it will be okay. And we add a placeholder squiggle and sometimes that's all that there has to be. There are times for that. But that's, that's often the case. Uh, Lisa also says, I'd love to have you do a session uh, all about manual underlay so we forget, that, you know, many of us create, forget that creating your own underlay is an option. Absolutely, we can do that. Um, and I apologize, Barbara asked if I have a certain kind of sample that I don't have queued up for me, but we will talk about that later and maybe I can bring in other folks who do. But yeah, bridal work, satin is another place where small text can be difficult. The other problem we have is that text on certain types of material can be difficult. Uh, one of the materials I often show, small text on sublimated materials that are printed with sublimation, all around the edges, we get a white halo. And so small text gets interfered with a lot by the white halo that'll appear. Because often these sublimated garments will have a full dark pattern on them or an all over print. Uh, the one I always struggled with was we would get uh, sublimated camo hats. So they would have a sublimated real tree pattern on them of some kind. Uh, and the dark versions of that were absolutely terrible. They have to run text on because if I had to run any light color text on, on top of that hat, I now have a halo of white thread that's being exposed when I pull the surface thread apart with that with the uh, embroidery. So frequently it wasn't worthwhile. I had to put fills behind it or do something else to offset that problem with the fabric. So it's, it is all about this interaction between everything that's happening. But I want to talk a little bit more about the technical side of this stuff. So I'm going to bring back up those examples I was showing you from the NQT file. Like I said, is it ideal? Absolutely not. Have I done some better small text? I think so. But there are some things to talk about. I'm going to bring up the, the R's that come out of that piece. We're going to take a look at them. So let me, let me pull these up. So this is the original R out of the piece, and it's not perfect. In fact, it's missing a piece of the underlay. Not great. But once again, we go back to the original. We can see it. It ran okay. That R is a little, uh, you can see that it's noodly. It doesn't look great. Why does it look a little noodly? Because it's missing a part of that underlay. Whereas other ones that have the underlay properly in place, they worked well. Like I said, this is not the final sample. This is an intermediate sample. But what I am going to show you is that there's different ways people go about this thing. So here's this same R done three different ways in Stitch Artist, right? So here I am, and like I said, it's not the software that makes the difference in this case. Uh, in this case, it is uh, it's really about what you know and what you don't know about what you need. So let me see if I can grab the right selection tool here so we can get over and get this rolling. But these are those R's. So there's the original R, and as we can see, it's missing that underlay, so it's a little noodly, doesn't look great. But what we can also see is in these different versions, we have different options, right? So here's the original version done the way that I usually would. What did I do? I have essentially a run stitch, a manual underlay, and that's here. So what did I do with this manual underlay? I ran, uh, this is going uh, right to left or left, uh, right to left instead of left to right. So if we jump in, we're going through this text and we're going back here to the original piece. So what we're going to find is that we have two runs underneath every part of that letter. So that is manual underlay. That was all done manually. And when you look at the individual stitches, what we're trying to achieve is that each one of these is right around at least a millimeter to 1.2 mils. You don't want to be any smaller than that for the underlay. There's no underlay set to the actual software in the software itself. So I'm not using any underlay in the software. It's all set manually. We also can see my start and end points are set so that I'm starting as close as I can uh, to the next point from each piece, right? So it's like, in this case, we're starting here on the bottom, on this bottom corner. We'll go ahead and select that piece again so you can take a look at it. If I can get, I've got a little slowdown going on my machine right here. So we're starting from the bottom, going up toward the top, and then we're starting from this bottom here, and we have a little crossover, and then we have this piece stitching from this point on. But what you're going to notice is, got nice low densities. Why? Like I showed you before, that underlay is going to cover some of that, just like this piece. We have nice low densities. We do see that I have a nice open counter here. The other thing to notice, there is a gap between the last part of this satin stitch and this backer. Why? Because when this pushes up, when this leg pushes up and down, when this piece pushes for, further closed, this will close up enough. Because I am at such infinitesimal sizes at this point for this thread, 
I know that I'm going to close this gap and I don't want to make it any tighter than it has to be. I don't want to overlap any more than I have to. So I've left space knowing that this will push down a little bit. Uh, this piece will push up a little bit. And when they do, they're going to meet in the middle enough that I get coverage. And that's exactly what you'll see here. On the original, which does cover, we have a, a small gap here. This satin stitch ends early. But there's my, you can see the shape. You can see the angle angle points that are set on it, the angle handles. Uh, and then we can see this piece too. It, for some reason, I managed to miss my inclinations on that. Should be a couple inclination lines there, but there you go. Uh, suffice to say, it's horizontal, so it, it matched decently with the ends, and so the auto uh, inclination handled it fine from Stitcher. It is. But that's one option, right? You run it like that. That's one of the options we have. One of the other options we, we have, you can put automatic on, and it would run all right. But the thing that you'll find is one of the other things people do, they'll eliminate the underlay and then they'll they'll add more. So it's like they'll add more density to it. So if we have that piece, let's say we take off, this is one, one version, right? Uh, first, actually, I'll say this. We'll start with this version. This is a single zigzag with a travel. So what you can see is this is traveling once underneath. And in this case, we're using uh, Stitch Arts' automatic parallel underlay. And then it's coming back and we see that there's a secondary zigzag. And let me see if I can play this back to you so you can see it a little more obviously. We can get into this section, what we can see is we run forward and we actually have a zigzag and then a, another travel line, and then we cover over. If we think about this in total, there's the density of this zigzag underlay, and then there's the density on top of it of the rest of this satin stitch. So this is not my method. My method is over here. I tend to use the manual underlay and no zigzag. But there are some folks who have lighter densities, even lighter than I'm using. So I'm using this fairly light density over here. Uh, you know, we're going into that 0.5 area, whereas somebody here is going even further out. We're in 0.6 and they are using extra underlay and they're using the underlay almost as an initial run. So if you've ever had somebody run text and it looks really anemic and not, uh, not filled enough and they'll tell you just to run it twice, this is a prefigured version of running it twice. We use a zigzag underlay and a little bit of travel, and then we run a loose density satin over the top. And in doing so, we don't end up with incredible densities. It doesn't maybe look quite as lumpy. And we can sometimes cover for some of the weird gaps that are, can occur when we're turning around uh, corners. We might have, as you can kind of see here, it's not perfect and because it, it hasn't been done manually. This is done with an automatic setup. Um, we do have lines that don't mesh with the exact short stitching that happens when we get into tight densities inside this corner. We can see that we've got this automatic short stitching here that has kind of helped us not to get too dense as we're going through the column. It'll do some short stitching. Well, that can leave a visible gap here. And you can see that if you had another zigzag that was maybe running through that gap, that sometimes those gaps would get covered up and you would have color coverage because of that zigzag. One of the other methods is to lighten up even more and use double zig. This is one that I, I very, very rarely use, but some people do. Um, they'll use a double zigzag underlay, as you see here, and then use a very light underlay or a very light coverage on top of that underlay in order to get the full coverage. Because once again, we start to zoom out, what you're gonna see is we've got some color coverage in the center. Uh, you, they may have the inset set even further out. I'll say that if you completely eliminate the inset on these, and I'll go ahead and kind of show you what I'm talking about, if you were to completely uh, eliminate all of the inset on this underlay, um, the one thing I will say is sometimes if you have any shifting, like let's see if we take all the inset off, we have no comp. Like if, if this was totally uncomped, um, what you would see is instead of this gap, you'd have it right out to the corners. And what I, I've sometimes seen is a visible kind of um, pointed look to where each one of these zigzags lands. So when people do this, and even when they do this singular kind of parallel or single zigzag underlay, you'll sometimes see the points on the outside edge of that underlay. So when I tend to do it or show it to people, I will back those down just a little bit and allow it to be mostly for color coverage under there. But that's the thing. All of these methods will work, including, frankly, if you are on a nice piece of material where it's not gonna sink, you could take this same piece, you could grab your little columns here, you could paste these out and say, all right, I've got zero underlay aside from travel on this piece, and I'm going to go ahead and drop all my underlay out so I have no chance of it sticking out. And then I'm going to go back up to the higher densities. You know, I'm going to grab this piece. I'm going to say, all right, I'm not going to go with these super small, you know, five mil dens or five point densities or, you know, 0.5 mils that you've got. I'm going to go back down to 3.9, 4. And I think that's super dense, but I've seen this as another answer. Now, why do people go with zero density? In fact, or zero underlay? Let me talk about that really briefly. Uh, this is the thing. We have this kind of underlay versus none. 
And honestly, I'm just talking about multiple underlays or different kinds of underlay. Why we have this fight is the reason that I talked about this a few shows back where we had underlay that pops out of the outside edges. It's because they often use edge run underlay or excessive underlay, too many rows of underlay, and it gets too thick or it's too close to the edges for the really small satin stitches they're running. Super narrow satin stitches, we get close to those edges and there's any sort of travel or wiggle, which is fairly common with something that's so small that texture and the fabric can alter it. Um, you will get underlay that pops out the side. We have little marching stitches that pop out of the outside edge of those satin stitches and it makes them look very rough and poor. Well, that's the thing. People then will answer that by saying, all right, I'm gonna rip my underlay out. I'm gonna do this guy. I'm gonna turn my densities up, I'm gonna rip my underlay out. Now, what I'm gonna tell you about this is this can get lumpy in the corners. This can end up pushing more than you want it to. You'll end up with extending this edge past. You'll end up extending these strokes too far down because we've got extra uh, density building up. And we can have issues depending on your short stitching with how uh, the corners look and how the tight edges look. If you put a ton of density in, we're gonna also have run a bunch of short stitching and it may or may not look great. Uh, the other thing is with, with really extreme density that all lands on the edge of a hole, we can cut an eyelet or rip holes in our garments. So, but what I'm going to say is on smooth materials, especially, yeah, if you can rip out that underlay you don't have to have a tremendous amount of density and it might work all right, uh, especially if we don't have a super high contrast of color. But when we're working with texture, we're working with contrast and color, we might want underlay to lift up that stitching. And we might even elect to do one of these heavier underlay styles. I would say test a few and see what works for you. For my money, the one that's been safest for me is to use longer stitches if I can in my underlay to make them manually connected so that any place where there is um, a gap where I'm going between two, two uh, blocks of stitching, two columns, there, there is not a gap between there because my manual underlay is connected and covers that gap. As we can see, the other place where we have coverage, where we have this little gap here is that my underlay goes between that and starts it out with a little tiny bit of color coverage. Also, because I have stitches that are long underneath those stitches that are there, we have long stitches that on top of which my top stitching is riding. My satin stitches are riding there. So when we look at these pieces, we can see that's that's what I'm doing with that center underlay. Um, if you have edge run underlay and not center run, all it means is really setting your inset. If you want to use automatic underlay, set your inset really tight so that your edge run underlay smashes to the center. That's all you got to do to make that happen. Um, if you have center run, you can use man, you can use automatic. What I'm going to say is. Automatic underlay doesn't always work with branching depending on your software. So if you have something grouped together as a branched object, um, you may not always have the underlay that you're hoping for with it. You might not always have the same um, the same connected underlay. Whereas with manual underlay, like I just showed you with this object that I made, it's all connected, it's all one stroke, and we don't have any breaks, meaning that I have additional coverage at all the junction points. Um, so for me, that's the way I like to do it. It doesn't mean it's the way you have to do it. But you make different decisions depending on what you're doing. I mean, that's that's really the thing. And you can make it work on different materials. I found that it really matters the material and the thread and the needle that you're using is going to make a big difference to how you digitize. Um, and if it doesn't, you're going to find out that there's variation involved. It's not always the end of the world. Sometimes the variation is okay. Sometimes it's not. You know, it really depends on what's acceptable for your particular use case. Um, I know one of the ones I remember doing that that caused me a great amount of consternation was a piece I did for a local uh, gas company, the, the gas company for New Mexico, New Mexico Gas Company, uh, unsurprisingly. So this is New Mexico Gas Company, and they were bought out by a place called Tico Energy for a period of time. And it meant that every single one of their garments had to get a Tico Energy Company in one line in bank gothic text underneath all of their logos at all scales, at all sizes. So some of these I ended up having to do with 68 threads. Some of them I had to do differently, but if you can see this bucket hat, and I'm gonna zoom in on it, it's pretty decent, right? It's not the end of the world, but what we can see is this is heavy cotton canvas. Um, this is absolutely textured. When we look at how coarse this is, um, we can see, is it causing some issues with my edge quality? Yes, but I'm getting some pretty small text. We're getting five mil text, reliably running, looking decent on this piece. What are the things that I had to understand about this work to make it work well? Number one, some variation was uh, gonna happen. This horizontal satin stitch bar, because we have kind of a an angle that this stuff's running on from cap to cap, it's a little bit different, uh, that the grain of the fabric was running on these bucket hats. Uh, I was gonna get some variation and a little bit of roughness in that. It was gonna do a little tiny bit of stair stepping, couldn't help it. 
Second thing, I'm going to use sharps. This is a sharp needle problem. You know, this is exactly what you use sharp needles for. Uh, I'm going to jam those sharps right through here because this stuff is very, very coarse. If I let it track back and forth of the ballpoint, it's going to look like hamburger. So I'm running sharps. It's not something I usually did. I usually run kind of a, a standard kind of transitional ball. But in this case, hey, I'm running sharps because this is this is the right case for them. It makes the best chance for this to work out. The other thing is, Strokes are going to be a little thick. I'm going to have to be really careful with it. And I'm going to have to open up the counters in the text. So if I go back and check that out, I mean, we can we can check it out. We'll actually look at the file. We can kind of see the different stuff that we're doing. I'll go ahead and back out of here so I can grab that file up for you. But if we look at that Tico Energy piece centered out, and we can grab that in software and have just a quick peek at it, um, this stuff really is about just kind of careful planning. We can see that, once again, Absolutely, tons of compensation, mass amounts of compensation in here. If we go zoom in on this piece, uh, we're gonna see that I'm following that same script, right? So same script is definitely on board. We're definitely trying to keep that same stuff going on where we're, we're working at on that same uh, setup. For some reason, I'm getting uh, some slowdown in my system, so I apologize, folks. Try and get that working for you. There we go. So. What we can see is I'm still being very careful about my counters and my openings. And especially if you see I had to do a smaller 60 weight version, even more so, we can see how much distortion is there. So like I said, once again, 60 weight version, very different thing, higher density, but we still had to be more distorted because it was even smaller piece. We go back to this piece though, we can see massive differences between the E and the N and the RGY. We have massive differences in height between the N and the E. We are definitely opening up counters. We have dropped the crossbar on the P. On Bank Gothic, this crossbar should probably be up about another two stitches right here. It'd be much narrower. But that little narrow gap is not going to work very well. It's not going to work for the proper uh, setup for this thread and needles. So it's like we just had to work on it. We had to make some differences. At the same time, um, what we can see is still kind of based on these same discussions. Um, the underlay in this, though, a lot of it's automatic. I can look from looking at this original piece. Uh, because of the way it's put together, this is not my underlay. This is automatic underlay. I've actually used an edge run underlay with an incredibly high inset because sometimes, depending on your software, it might be more efficient in the pathing than I did for, uh, than I would for like a manual. So it, it would for a, uh, certainly for a center run, sometimes the pathing's not efficient. In this case, though, at this size, you know, the automatic underlay ran okay. Wasn't too bad. If we look at the 60 weight though, uh, 60 weight thread, you go in here and you'll start to notice we're not using that automated underlay everywhere anymore. And now we've got some of this is manual, especially in the difficult letters. But in some of it, yeah, still using automatic in the places where it makes sense because it just didn't really matter. Sometimes uh, letters that are more complicated, uh, M is one of them for sure. M's and R's, things that are made up of multiple blocks, uh, especially when we have to kind of adjust for things like when we have capped ends like this, we can end up where there are some gaps inside of those caps. That is very common for me to want to use a manual underlay that goes under the entire thing or to uh, branch the entire thing so that the underlay runs all at one, one time. So like I said, it's about this. We're dealing with the distortion. We are understanding the texture that's there. We know that the geometry of the needle makes a difference to our, our setup. We know that the width of the needle has a great deal to do with how big a stitch we can make as well as the grain of the fabric. And when we're talking about underlay, we know that the function of underlay is to hold up what's on top of it. So we have our little underlay stitch here and we have our satin stitch on top. It can't pass through. It's not gonna interact with the garment because it's interacting with the underlay. We have a couple passes underlay and our satin stitch is holding onto those and it's lifting them up. And we also know that if we use support materials, especially on things that sink like that knit that I showed you earlier, that we can use support materials like uh, water soluble topping and that topping, that layer holds up our stitches even more and keeps them from sinking in under the tension that's normal and natural to machine embroidery. So that's the thing, right? Just depends on what you're doing. You have to look at the holistic nature of the thing you're working on. So the question isn't, is it right to do underlay or none? It's how do I achieve coverage and a clean edge and the look that I want on the fabric I have? If you see me working on a patch, 
then I'm working directly on a low contrast twill, there's a much higher chance that I'm not going to dump a bunch of underlay under there than if I'm working on that canvas that has texture, a knit shirt, or anything of that like. Knit shirt's going to get underlay for sure. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of caps get underlay also because I'm also dealing with things like the flagging of the hat and the fact that I want to attach that cap down to the, to the stabilizer so I can get that cap crown as flat to my needle plate as possible before I start stitching my top stitching. So it's all of that put together. What does make sense though, uh, we should, like I said, think about those material considerations, understand your needle size, know that thin thread requires different settings. Uh, 68 thread, I didn't bring up slides for it, but it does go about, like I said, a quarter smaller, 25% smaller than we can do with 48 thread. But when we do it, we have to understand that we are dealing with those material considerations and that the size of the needle can also be affected by the structure of the garment we're working on. And that's the deal. So why do I kind of advocate for things like manual underlay? It's just more control. Because what I know is I am building a foundation on which the top text is setting, this top satin stitch is setting. And it could be any kind of satin stitch. I was going to teach you all sorts of more stuff today. Like we were going to talk about manual stitching and everything else. I think I'm going to stick mostly with satins and finish out today. But the thing is, there's, there's lots to understand about it. But the ultimate nature of this thing comes down to the single stitch. It still comes down to a stitch under tension that's trying to suck down into the fabric on which it's, or through which it's being stitched. At tension, the stitches are going to tighten in, they're going to narrow, uh, stitches stacked together because they roll off of each other are going to expand in the direction of push. And that nature is what's playing into everything. What makes text look poor? Small, uh, small text often looks poor because we have um, too much underlay. Like I said, if you start running three, four passes of underlay under a really narrow column, your column is 0.8 millimeters wide, and you run four passes of underlay under it before you do your top stitching, you now have the same width. You have built up the same thickness of straight stitches, because we know if we run straight stitches on top of each other in the same spot, they all roll off of each other. Thread doesn't stand on thread, so it's going to roll off of each other. You've built up the same thickness as that top satin stitch. So what makes that look poor? Because you've either run too many underlay stitches or you're using edge run underlay and it's too close to the edges and the stitches pop out the edge. Something's shifting in the hoop and you have stitches that are close to the edge where you've just got normal underlay and the, the satin stitch is not riding where it's supposed to be. It's landing somewhere outside of your underlay and so underlay is sticking out. Those are the chief reasons. That's why people rip the underlay out. However, when you're on textured material, especially something where it's not shifting in the hoop, it's great to have the underlay back in because the underlay is now providing you that basis to lift up the stitching. It's not no underlay versus underlay. It's which underlay is right for today's work, which underlay is correct for the texture that it's trying to mitigate for the thing that it's on top of, for the amount of coverage I need between these colors. And I think that's the hardest part about this is what we want is a super fast and steady rule for this stuff. And it's not, right? It makes sense. So like uh, Sydney says here, I don't mind changing needles, sharps, and regular. You'd be amazed at the difference it can make. Absolutely. And I'll also admit that um, if your thread runs fine with it and the garment's fine with it, running the 7010s uh, and with your thread can be, with still with 48 thread can make a difference. A finer needle can make a nicer looking uh a nicer looking letter. I, I mean, if you guys have seen uh, videos from or content from Vitor, from Luis Vitor, um, he has done some tests with that where the same stuff with a sm smaller needle can look a little finer. Absolutely. And sharps on a garment that requires sharps will make a difference because the ball points will travel on different sides of that coarse material, whereas the sharps will punch right through. Uh, and yeah, Cindy says, correct stabilizer too. You, I didn't mention it, but you're right. Yeah. Using the right stabilizer, if, you're, if your material is unstable, if it stretches too much, if it shifts too much, if it moves too much during the process, there's a much higher likelihood of you having shifting that exposes some underlay or that reveals some errors or causes some tracking. Like I said, some tracking where you're tracking on either side of some texture or some coarseness in the weave of a garment that can be exacerbated. It can be increased by not having a stable hoop, by not having the right stabilizer that's providing you with the uh, like I said, the dimensional stability, the resistance to stretch and shifting that you need. So like, it's something that I always say. We always like to make these big, 
these big versus matches, right? I always make this joke that it's always this big one way versus the other, my way versus the other guy, one digitizer versus the other digitizer. And is that real? No, <laughs> not really. But different methods do make a difference. But the truth of the matter is, is it real that we just absolutely have one way that works and one way that doesn't? Absolutely not. What works on a towel? What works on a sweatshirt? What works on a piquet polo shirt? What works on a dress shirt? What works on satin? What works on tulle is different. And smooth materials let us do a lot of crazy stuff. I'm going to bring up something. We talk about thin threads, and I always show uh, my 75 weight one that kind of blows people away. And the thing is, it wasn't difficult to achieve. It just looks crazy. This is the 75 weight piece that I usually show when I was first testing 75 weight thread when Madeira offered it to me. I wanted to do something that had a lot of detail in it. And we can see this is detailed. I mean, what's crazy is if we look tight, look at the eyes. We have open eyes in the middle of this piece. And we are talking about that is a dime. That is real embroidery. Uh, I ran that. And what you're not going to believe is I ran this on a home machine because I had to do this from my home office over, you know, over a short period of time where I couldn't jump into the jump into the shop and get on multi-needle. So this was run on a home machine. So we're not talking about massive equipment purchases. We are not talking about the highest end of everything and the best software. That doesn't matter nearly so much as understanding what's possible. In this case, is everything perfect? Absolutely not. I'm seeing some issues, including some tension issues that had to do with the machine I was running on. But when we look at this piece, how am I getting text that looks like I could have it engraved on a dime? Well, how am I getting that? Because I'm at 75 weight thread. It can run at half the size of what we can do with 40 weight thread, but the needle is hair fine and it bends and it, you can see it deflecting. If you pull on the thread too hard while you're threading it, you can see the needle pulling toward you. The needle is not super strong. I wouldn't want to do 75 weight thread on a structured hat because the needles would just snap. If you had a problem, it would, they would be popping off, you know, every two seconds. It'd be like a might as well be stitching it with a piece of dry spaghetti. I mean, it, it just is so fine. I can't imagine that you'd want to do that. Is there somebody who probably has managed it better than me? I'm sure. Heck, uh, hit me with the video. I'd love to see you do it. Uh, not because I don't believe you can, but I'd love to watch it because I'd be impressed. The thing is, when we look at this piece, the same rules are applying to this as 40 weight, just on a smaller scale. And the shirt that I'm running this on, this is a dress shirt. It is dress like poplin or dress twill shirt. This is incredibly fine material that looks like canvas. Cause when we zoom in it, you can see the texture. The thing is that texture is so fine that it's not really causing any issues. And we can stitch these like two millimeter letters in satin stitches that look like the original font. Why? Incredibly fine needle, incredibly fine uh, thread at twice the density. It's got densities on it that look like the numbers we would use for 3D foam if we were with 40 weight thread. So what are the essential things we're learning here is that it's down to the combination of the different materials and the, the sizes and settings that we have. How does this work? The width of the needle and the thickness of the thread are the things that we're fighting with as well as the nature of the material. The needle is super fine. The thread is super fine. The material is very flat and doesn't have a bunch of texture to it. I can run that 75 weight thread and I can take an existing 40 weight thread design and shrink it by half. And as long as I run it all in 75 weight thread on that super fine material with that super fine grain, it will run. Does it mean it's easy? No, it means we have to adjust our tensions on our machine as well because we're running a much thinner thing. And if you pass a thinner, a thinner thread, uh, through the same tension plates that you had set to the tension for 40 weight thread, well, if it's half as thick, we're going to have to increase our tension settings in order to get it to run right with the bobbin. So this is the thing. It is about the things that we can't change. The physical nature of embroidery, the physical nature of the thread, the thickness of the thread and the needle inform what we can do. How thick can I make a satin stitch? How wide can I make it? How small can a hole be? And how small can text or details be? Can you make eye-wateringly small lettering? Yeah, you can. The things we have to ask ourselves are, are very simple questions. Number one, why? <laughs> why are we making very small lettering? Is it because we want it to be there for some reason? Because we just like the stunning detail and people are overjoyed by looking at stunning detail? That's an okay reason. If it's to read it, that's not a great reason. 
If it's because someone who's supposed to be looking at this garment can see and use that information, maybe not so much. For this piece, it's a seal from a place that is known. If you see somebody wearing this, if they probably have other text that's identifying them on the shirt that they're wearing, this is just supposed to look like their seal and look like embroidery and it achieves those two things. And as long as it's on a dress shirt or a lab coat or something with a nice fine grain and a smooth front on it, I don't even have to use topping material. I can just stitch this out and it'll run fine. The day I want to put this on a super heavy six panel buckram hat with a seam right down the middle, I'm going to be crying little tears that I ever showed anybody I did this, or I'm going to be making a lovely patch with 75 weight thread that I then attach later because it's not going to work for everything. And that's the same kind of case we're in in general. It doesn't mean that anybody's wrong or right when they give you these tactics. It's that they're achieving the same things. They're looking at you the same things. How do I get coverage? How do I get fine detail? How do I keep details open enough? How do I make sure the satin stitches look clean enough and cover enough? And these can be achieved in multiple ways. How do we get coverage? By making sure there's enough thread between us and the garment. That can be achieved by adding underlay with less with less uh, top stitching. That can be achieved by adding more top stitching with no underlay, provided we don't have any texture that's causing problems. Eventually, what we're dealing with is literally the nature of the thing as it should be obvious to us. We, we eliminate this by worrying about technical definitions. But the truth of the matter is, can we drop the needle far enough away so it doesn't drop in the same hole? Can I uh, put down just enough thread to get coverage without packing it so tight that I start to have the needle gumming up inside of that hole and flapping my hoop around and breaking thread? And can I leave the holes open enough uh, that, that we can see inside of these holes so that the A doesn't close up, the R doesn't close up? But also, can I do that while not stabbing too many holes in, in something where we end up with the fabric opening up an eyelet? How do I do those things? And it's about mitigating how close together those penetration points are, how much density we're using, so how close together the lines of thread are, and how we achieve that coverage. My way, add some underlay, lighten the top density, usually works for me. Sometimes I'm gonna do it a different way. On smooth material, probably gonna go ahead and add a little more density and drop out some of that underlay depending, because that's fine. It just won't cause problems if it's smooth material, but it shifts. Mostly I'm still gonna use that underlay because it doesn't cause trouble as long as I have a manually punched center underlay like I often do for tiny, tiny text. Um, that usually works on more substrates than not. But can you do the zigzag version? Absolutely, seen it looks decent, has texture that you can deal with, has good coverage, manually punched zigzags can even be more selective about where they hit, uh, where they kind of cover up from areas of that weird short stitching. And you can do more with it. Lighten up the top density even more so that we don't ever stack a bunch of stitching right next to each other. We have multiple zigzags that come together and eventually get us coverage so that we have a nice coverage on, on the color that we're working on, but don't build up a bunch of excessive density that causes us to have more push issues. So like I said, it is the nature of the thing that makes it the way it is. And I'm gonna show you one more brief thing before I close out and then I'll answer a couple last questions and talk to folks when they show up. But let me go ahead and one last kind of thing to, to discuss about this. I'm just gonna show you one more example that I think is worthwhile. And this is in uh, creating some text that I'll actually show you first some of the original samples. So this is the thing, I'm gonna show you a sample. It is not perfect. But this is one of the samples that comes out of an Imbrillian's product called Merrily. It's the, the product that we have that lets you make patches automatically. And for that piece, I created a, a set of micro and 68 fonts that run very small. And this is some of my initial sampling, once again, on a home machine, because I wanted to go you know, lowest common denominator. This is a very, very cheap home machine so that anyone who used those, I wanted to make sure it work. What we can see here is in this micro sizes, we're down under that four millimeter range. We're like at about 4.2, four millimeters. And we're running very reliably, nice open block letters that look good. And we've got some other, other setups up here. And what we can see between them is that there's some differences between some of the shapes and how it's digitized. You can see how much more open this A is down here than the A up here. And depending on your level of um, contrast, you might see a little more edge to it. You might see some other variation, but we're running reliably with keyboard lettering with automatic settings at four millimeters. So it's something that you can achieve. The thing is, what I want you to be, be kind of cognizant of and to see is that depending on sizes, even if you're making text, especially when you're making text specifically for a size, you might make some pretty big changes, right? In the different lettering, you might make some pretty big different decisions when you're coming to how you digitize stuff. So let me go ahead and bring this up and I'm gonna go take myself like out of the corner here so you can see it. 
just for a second. I can zoom myself back in a second. But what I want you to see is in each of these uh, iterations of this lettering, they look like they're the same font. And from a distance, you might even say, oh, they're all the same font. They look exactly the same. But if we look at these different fonts, right, once we get in, in real tight to these fonts, it starts to become obvious really quickly. All right, so here is uh, Merrily Coast. So it's like a Coast Guard type of font. It's a font that's often used for the Coast Guard. And it is actually, you know, it's a, a standard kind of grotesque font that we've seen other places. But we also have a Coast Mini. What's the difference between Coast and Coast Mini? Well, there's lots of different ones. But if we look at this Pangram, uh, Sphinx of Black Courts, Judge My Vow is a Pangram. It has all the letters in it. So you can really kind of get a look at them. If we look at the A between these two pieces, look how it's digitized differently. The crossbar is dropped. I have manually done that. And I left the base uh, underlay on it. You could always tune the underlay, and you should. And you should tune the compensation for your particular garment. But look at how different those A's are. They're digitized differently for the size. When we get down to these really small sizes, in this case, you know, our, our top end, it's got a comma in it, so it's throwing ours up. If we measure out our text on this piece, you know, we're we're talking four to five mils. In this case, we're, you know, we're we're really looking at a five millimeter letter on that particular one. But if we look down at some of the other really small versions, we have fire, which is a kind of a fire department themed font. And we have the standard, we have the micro, and we have the 68. And the funny thing is, we look at this piece. Look at how different the B is from the standard to the micro, how different the A is, the crossbar, the width of the A, the opening is more open. We've made wider letters because when we get down to a point where this aperture, this opening in the C is too narrow, it's not going to run. Does it look wildly different? No, a customer is going to see these and they're likely going to see these as the same font. But to an embroiderer, why does this matter? Because if I look at the minimum size of both of these fonts, the hole that's in this R and the hole in the R below it are very similar in size. If I zoom in, in fact, I'd say that the aperture here is a little tight. I've got some comp, some, uh, comp on this. I probably have two points of comp on this guy, if I would guess, which I do. i got a couple points of comp. I could probably drop a point of comp out to look at it a little more reliably for the size. But we can see that those holes stay open on the on the mini side. And then when we get down to the 68 micro, it's got a tighter, I've set some tighter, um, some tighter densities on it, but you can also see I'm keeping those holes open as much as I can. I'm keeping those apertures open. I'm working toward the nature of the font, but if we, the nature of the font and the nature of thread and the needle. If we look at the original piece though, it is a taller letter, it's more open. This one's a little shorter. We have some more comp that's involved in this whole piece. We can also see that things like, uh, we have a little bit of push comp that's manually been done for these Satins that make up the serifs, the crossbar serifs on the top. Why? Because at the small sizes, it needs a little more comp. And even if we look over here, we've got our Army and Air Force style kind of fonts that are here. And in these, though they're big blocky fonts that don't seem to have that much going on, look at the difference in the aspect between this S here and the S here. This is also where we go, all right, compromise. This is a 40 weight. The top one is a 40 weight standard. This was a 40 weight mini. And the bottom was a 60 weight micro. And what can we tell? Well, a couple different things. Also, look at our N. We have an overlapped setup for the corners on this size. But then if we go smaller here, we actually have a we have a lapped version of this where we have a fully lapped top and bottom area where we're we're going to where this, these two uh, columns meet. So in this case, we have a cap instead of the full lap. So this capping means we don't have excess density on the really small sizes, but on the sizes that can take it, we want that texture, we leave it open. These are the compromises we make and the choices we make in digitizing that are all about getting the coverage to balance with the density with the overall look. So in this case, like I said, we have these choices that get made at different sizes. When we see these options, and what I'm gonna say too, if you're using keyboard fonts to do super micro stuff, look for ones that are set up, that are made to go small, um, if you're in our software, we have a limit for how small things will go to try and keep you on track. If you are in other software that does not limit it physically, then look at the font listing itself to see what that smallest size it was intended for was and take a look. But what you're ultimately looking for is the same stuff. The smallest stitch that will render correctly, the smallest hole that will stay open and not make an eyelet. And honestly, to look at the coverage, what kind of density and coverage is possible and will run correctly for that particular uh, setup, for that particular design. Can we get 
to a density that's useful or is it too dense at certain layers? Can we get to a place where there's too many layers together? And should we make different choices about that? It's the same thing we would do with a stock design. It's the same thing we would do with any kind of digitizing. It's just a lot easier to see fall apart when we have these nice big straight lines of text that we're working with. So, all right, let's close this up. We are way past time. We have gone gone through it to the, to the ends of the earth, but I'm gonna say, here's the thing, right? There are possibilities out there, but it's stuff that we have to think about. It's stuff that we have to consider. Yes, we can make tiny texts. Yes, it is possible. We should first think why. After that, we should think how. And in that how is the sum total of all the things that are going to build up this interaction. The material, the thread, the needle, and our choices as digitizers all come together to make what the final result is. But all of this is ruled ultimately by the nature of the stitch the nature of embroidery itself. The compensations that we have to do are there because of distortion that is naturally there, because of the nature of the thread, because of the three-dimensional reality of what we're putting together. Let's go ahead and last couple comments, and then I'm going to go ahead and finish out. Uh, Frank says, tried 75 weight and had to back off tension too much with the 55-6 needle, too many thread breaks. Yeah, 75 weight, it's just, it, you can make it run, but it's under such specialized conditions that I think it's really, it's a specialty thread. It should be for those conditions. And there's lots of great threads that will run and stuff that sometimes people don't expect. Uh, one of the other ones I, I put up here sometimes and people don't believe me until I show them is metallics. Sometimes you can use, a. this is a FS50 from Madeira. I'll give you the brand because it's the real one that you're looking at. It is a 50 weight, a thin metallic. It's not as thin as 60 weight thread, but it is thin and you can get nice fine details. That is a Piquet polo shirt with a simple fire department logo. And the text is fairly small, but not super small. You know, we're at the five, six millimeter round here. They're not tiny, tiny letters, but they are small and they look nice and clean. We have to use a little more density, but it's possible, but it's possible because we take into account the things that are going to cause issues. This is a Piquet Polo. We can see some texture. What's a great option for this? Definitely go ahead and run some topper. Run some water-soluble topper on that sucker, and you'll be a lot happier with it. Um, if I wouldn't run a finer needle necessarily, 7010, I'm going to stay there because even though it's a 50-weight thread, I want to have uh, lots of space in the eye of the needle to make it work. But at the same time, you know, it's not something where I'm going to go super tight to get that fine outcome. But it's possible. But how is it possible? by being really aware of what thread does, by being aware of what the needle does, by being aware of what the machine does and what they're all gonna do under tension and at speed, <laughs> which is the other thing I didn't mention at all. Um, running super fast, sometimes uh, small tiny text or too many penetration points in the same place, they're, they're allergic to running super fast because that's where we get more thread breaks. So I should say, um, I think these things are all valuable to think about. I think it's worthwhile to understand, but <laughs> The ultimate thing to understand too is that it should make uh, make sense to the piece we're working on. Yes, sometimes, as with our our friend the Kinesio Taping Association man, uh, sometimes stuff that doesn't seem to make sense to us uh, technically is useful because it represents the brand and it makes the person who is buying this from you happy that you they can see the detail in it, and that is a viable reason to put detail like this in. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be removed, but do think about the why. Understand that the limitations are there. Also understand that people like me and uh, people who are showing you stuff on trade show floors and people who are selling things to you, um, it is in their best interest for you to see some cool pieces. Rafal's work is awesome. Um, Will you use this all the time? Probably not. Most customers are not going to ask you or be happy with super fine thread, uh, straight stitch text on all of their gear. Their company name looking like this is not really the thing. Um, does it? Is it great? The machine's running good. That's a good machine. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, is it duplicitous in some way? No, they're not lying to you. But the thing is, they're showing you this thing that's supposed to stop you and make you look. And I'm doing the same thing sometimes. Um, this piece is not the bread and butter of what I did. Um, but I will say, honestly, this piece is trying to make small text work under bad situations like this. Yeah, that's real. Um, the piece for Karen Kuhn, this piece is trying to make fonts work, even if they're not ideal for the size. That's bread and butter. The, but the, the ultimate tiny text, the tiniest thing you can make 
is probably not realistic for most work unless it's something you are specifically hanging your hat on and saying, this is me, I am the person. I'm hanging out my shingle as the tiny text person who makes the most awesome tiny text and it's all I do. And if you want little bitty text, it's me. Unless you are doing that specifically, most work for people where you're doing logos. And I would even say that a lot of, even patches and other stuff that has small text, yes, you have to get familiar with it, but you're not gonna be pushing it to the ultimate ends of the earth where you're doing 75 weight thread, where you're doing these super tiny things. And if you are, it's time to think about design. It's time to think about options for dealing with that text differently. It's time to talk to customers about what's realistic. Um, because when we beat our heads against something and when we do something like using the super fine thread where we're getting the way that Frank said, we've got thread breaks all over the place. Now we're reducing our capacity to create. We're reducing our capacity to run. We have a bunch of spoilage. We have garments sitting there that have broken threads that we couldn't uh, manage to run correctly or that look horrible. And if we're at the very edge of the envelope all the time, it's cool to do for artistic reasons. It's cool to do for a show piece. It's cool to do for something that's hanging on the wall where we're gonna perfect it for one big big run or it's individual boutique things. We're doing a very small run and we can baby it and watch it and make sure it runs. For the commercial world, for stock designs, for things like that, it makes much more sense to make a little more bomb proof, deal with the art, design for the medium and understand that a little bit of flexibility goes a long way. All right, folks, been a long show. I knew it would be a long show and I didn't even cover straight stitch text. We'll do it another day, but I'm um, glad to have you guys here. Thank you for showing up for the small text episode. I'm sure it won't be the last one, but hopefully we've gotten somewhere that you feel like you've learned a little bit or it opened your eyes or reminded you of something you already knew because all of these things are valuable to us. And like I said, hopefully it'll make you think a little bit about the next time you go to do text. Think about the why, think about the how, and make sure you're taking into account the place where this text is going to live and who's looking at it. All right, folks, can't wait to see you again next week and have a nice break. Take it easy on yourself and, you know, do the things that make sense. And I'll see you next time. <laughs>